Well, well, welcome everyone to uh, uh, the Race Academy webinar series. Uh, again, oral appliances is to treat snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. Um, this topic is very close to my heart, as you may have seen, should I have uh, applied some of our learnings today to, uh, uh, to what we're doing. We'd, uh, I'd be far better off with my lack of uh, sleepy, sleepless sleepiness during the day and I would be far more astute and awake for times such as these. Anyway, welcome everyone again. I can see today we have an enormous following of well over 100, 120 nearly uh, people who signed up today and I guess that not only shows the degree of uh, excitement around this topic of snoring and sleep apnea, but also no doubt drawn by Associate Professor Michael Stubbs, who we'll talk about in a moment, who'll be joining us today. Um, but yeah, just whilst we're waiting for the last few people to sign on, um, I'd like to welcome people from Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom, United States, Malaysia and Taiwan. So welcome one and welcome all. I love that we come together as a globe uh, in these topics and I really enjoy um, uh, what we can do in helping the world uh, in grow and learn. And it's all done digitally now. So I really enjoy that we can learn anytime, anywhere. And again, um, after this, this, these topics will be filmed and on our uh, website that can be rewatched at any time. So I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, um, Professor or Associate Professor Michael Stubbs. Uh, Michael Stubbs trained firstly as a dentist and then chose to specialise in a diagnosis and treatment of patients with facial and jaw pain that wasn't derivative from the teeth themselves. Um, Associate Professor Michael Stubbs also diagnoses and manages any disorder uh, or disease involving the mouth or jaws and specialises in sleep apnea and snoring disorders with the use of custom-made medical devices. Um, it's a very close topic. I'm a sleep apnea sufferer, as to uh, most of my family. I've used a number of the devices, uh, the oral or the mandibular advancement devices. So I'm particularly interested today to learn more. I'm particularly interested today to find out um, as much as I can from, from the guru uh, himself. So with no further ado, uh, over to you, Associate Professor Michael Stubbs. Thank you, Matt. That was very kind. The guru. Wow. Um, well, let me just uh, do a share screen because I think like a lot of people, even those colleagues watching this presentation, interesting to see how many of them have snoring or perhaps sleep apnea. I do as well, and or I did, and I wear a dental device like uh, you do, and uh, I don't have the problem anymore. So I'll just pull this up. Um, I thought what might be rather nice is just to uh, present a form, just a bit of a format, a structure, if you like, because unlike all dentists, we know how to do scans, digital scanning. Uh, some of us do still impressions, et cetera, but the point is we're experts at working in the mouth. We also realise that when we're treating people with snoring or sleep apnea, what we're really trying to do here is influence the amount of space or opening we can create in the upper airway which by definition is be the space behind the tongue and obviously a little bit behind the nose and uh, slightly at the base of the tongue. And, you know, there's been a lot of um, interesting articles, certainly in more recent times. This rather dramatic article was published in The Age about 16 years ago called The Fatal Snore. And little did they know that when they published that article as an attractive headline, there is a lot of truth in this. We know that 90% of snorers don't have sleep apnea. Only 10% of the snorers do. But what's interesting is the association of a patient who has untreated sleep apnea, either A, may not even be aware that they have the condition, and B, uh, it's incredible the number of patients that come and even if they've had a sleep study, which I'd like to talk a little bit about too to explain what that is, and they have sleep apnea, they're more focused on the snoring. And snoring, I suppose you could call it noise pollution because really what you're doing is um, you are disturbing your partner's sleep, sometimes the whole household. And all of us, I'm sure, have a relative that we can think of in the past perhaps, even currently, that uh, could literally raise the roof with their snoring level. You know, in Australia, we know that about, or well, it's estimated about 40% of men snore. But let me tell you, 20% of women do too. So... It's not just a male disorder. And as you can see in these photographs, uh, the husband's all very 
uh, lovely sound asleep and the poor wife struggling. And that's why we always say we treat two people, not one. We also know that it's not unusual sometimes for people to end up sleeping in different rooms, different ends of the house. I, I had a patient who was an architect and he designed their new home and he was down one end and she was down the other, his wife, because of the snoring. Incredible. So as dentists, we have a great opportunity to help people with this problem. But even more importantly, we're all health professionals and we recognise the value in how we can help somebody transform their life, both from a health point of view, but also from a tiredness point of view. And you can see here in this particular study published in 2005, sleep apnea was estimated in the US to involve 16% of men and about 5% of women. But we also realise now that those numbers are certainly changing. And uh, certainly in 2013, uh, 25% of men were estimated to have sleep apnea and 10% of women. I'd go as far as to probably say it's higher even now than what it was when that was published. So this is not a condition that's being created. It's actually a condition that's been around for a long time. It's just that now it's being recognised. And as dentists... We have a unique opportunity to form partnerships with um, sleep physicians and actually learn how to help our patients, particularly those who have either snoring or sleep apnea. In an Australian context, it's thought about 5% of the population have obstructive sleep apnea. And you might ask me, what is obstructive sleep apnea? Well, that means that if you actually, uh, during the course of the night sleeping and you stop breathing for more than 10 seconds, we deem that is an apnea event. And so that means your oxygen levels normally between, say, 96%, 92% can drop. And more importantly, you then recover from the obstruction. And then as a result of that, you go from deeper sleep to lighter sleep. And as a result, you don't physically open your eyes and say, oh, I just had a, an apnea attack. But it's a cumulative. And over um, a period of time, you may end up stop breathing six times an hour, 10 times an hour. 50 times an hour. And each time you have those apnea events, it obviously means you're getting disturbance in the quality of your sleep. I think what's interesting in all the Australian context that only 10 to 20% of people in Australia are actually diagnosed, which from an Australian point of view means there's about 80 to 90% of people out there in that 5% cohort that have sleep apnea and don't realise it. Or they don't realise there's other treatments available other than a CPAP, which I'd like to explain in a moment. We also realise, of course, that, you know, fat people are not the only ones that have sleep apnea. Many of us, me included, who are very thin, have the condition as well. And I think it's important to say that looking at our body weight is one aspect, but also considering other conditions, like some people are on medications that make them very drowsy at night, and that can compound uh, apnea if you already have the condition. Alcohol consumption. How many people here watching this know that if you're snoring, and you actually have a few drinks, certainly before you go to bed, that volume of snoring really increases in the crescendo. And the reason is because the alcohol suppresses some of the reflexes that you have intuitively to keep your airway open at night, but also muscle tone relaxes. And as we get older in life, a lot of us realise everything tends to go uh, slacker, go south. And so the thing is, what we do is we know that the airway can itself become uh, more narrow and hence more of an issue. And, you know, it's estimated, certainly, uh, this is US data, but it's interesting, you know, 30 to 49-year-olds, 10% of them are thought to, in men, and 70% of 50 to 70-year-olds are uh, thought to have obstructive sleep apnea. And in women, uh, certainly 30 to 49-year-old women, 3% would have uh, or likely got a sleep apnea. And as they've got older, 50 to 70-year-olds, 9%. So, you, you know, if you think about your average practice, and let's say you have a database of 3,000 patients, you can start to realise, can't you, that you'd have probably of those at least 16, maybe 20% of them have snoring or sleep apnea issues, which you may not even be aware of. And we know that CPAP is a technology which is a well-established medical treatment. It's actually a pump. Now, what happens is you have a mask, whether it be nose, full facial mask, um, and the idea is it doesn't artificially make you breathe. It actually keeps your airway open. So that way you don't go for those breaks in sleeping. You just breathe consistently and therefore you get a good night's sleep. 
problem with sleep apnea and CPAP is about 40 to 60 percent, depending which study you look at, people find them hard to get used to. You know, people find that sometimes they pull the mask off. And I mean, here we can see um, um, some interesting fun photos, but these people, you know, like a lot of people, genuinely have this sense that is that what they're meant to do for the rest of their life, be attached to a hose? Um, and, you know, when travelling resumes, I mean, hopefully most of us get soon in a few years can get back to travelling again. You know, lugging a CPAP machine on the plane is, is cumbersome, it's difficult. So a lot of people, like colleagues watching this, may, you may have a very large cohort of your own patients that are CPAP users and they buy the machine and it's under the bed, it's in the garage or in the attic. And they don't realise as a dentist you can do other options for treatment. And when we talk about other options, what we're really talking about is what we call mandibular advancement splints. So we're aiming to pull the jaw forward, pull the tongue base forward and open up the back of the airway. And you can see in this simple photograph here where the gentleman's got um, the uh, normal occlusion, centric occlusion, no device in, and then with the device in where the mandible's been protruded, we can see the positioning of the chin. Obviously, the tongue base where the scribe is has also come forward. Therefore, the airway has opened up more. Usefulness is sometimes some patients aren't interested in treatment with devices and they're looking at surgery. And I'd never underestimate the value of orthognathic surgery where they can have the mandible and or the maxilla advanced. But for a lot of people, that doesn't suit them. It might be because medically they may be um, not fit enough to have the procedure. They may not be able to afford the procedure. And also not everyone likes surgery. So again, you know, coming back to what we do best conservative treatment, making a dental device is a really good option, especially for patients who uh, either don't need CPAP or have it and don't like wearing them. And we also understand that you can see in this um, comb beam here, this is a patient with centric occlusion. You can see the normal dimensions of the airway as defined. When the device is placed in the mouth, here we've got increasing width of the airway. So we know that from an evidence-based approach, they work. What you might not realise is that when we talk about dental devices and that advanced the mandible, we don't just pull the tongue forward. We do seem to have an impact also on the soft palate. And so this is called the nasopharyngeal region, and this actually can also be slightly enlarged as well. So sometimes you might have a patient who wears a device and says, you're not going to believe this. Whenever I go to sleep at night and go to lie on my back, I can't breathe through my nose. I now wear the device and now I can. And that's not unusual. And, you know, you might be thinking to yourself, well, how would I know the patient's got sleep apnea? Well, I'll tell you what, a couple of things. We're experts at the upper airway. And so if you have a look at this, this is called the Friedman tongue position. Very simple. And I just want to quickly explain it to you because these are useful things that you can consider in the back of your mind. First of all, this is a patient who's got their tongue in their mouth, all four, and have a look at the soft palate. You can clearly identify the uvula. It's called Friedman tongue position. Type one. Type two is where you see the arches, but no uvula tip. Type three, just the tips of the arches, and that's about it. And as you can see, type four, no arches, no uvula. Significance is that the probability of this type of group based on one anatomical feature, long soft palate, is, increases the probability that they may well have snoring issues, but certainly possibly sleep apnea as well. And that's just visually looking in the mouth. Then you take a look at the next circumference. You know, have a look at your patients. Have they got a small chin? Are they retronathic? Again, retronathia, mandible being uh, small and therefore not very far forward. Tongue sits in the mandible closer to the back of the throat, intuitively a narrow airway. Very easy stuff as the patient's walking in. You know, you check it out, the fact they've got a steep mandibular plane. They open their mouth as you start to examine them. You notice that they don't really show much of a uvula or they may have a very large tongue. How would you know that? Because if you have a look at the tongue, if the tongue overlaps over the occlusal surfaces of the molar, then you know that the tongue is quite large for the space it's got. Again, these are simple things, but they add up to help demonstrate perhaps a patient may have snoring or sleep apnea issue. And when we do them, I use a George gauge. Um, now, some of you watching this might use alternative methods. That's great. The George gauge is a very simple way of uh, engaging the bite fork on the upper and lower teeth, patient bites in centric occlusion. 
the little tiny fork here sits on what we call a scar, which has got numbers, millimetres, then they advance the mandible maximally forward, and we can determine in millimetres just what their range of movement is. The average human being is about six to eight millimetres is the average protrusive range, and generally speaking, we try to get minimum five millimetre advancement for a sleep apnea patient. Um, you get more confidence in the fact that you're going to get a better outcome with the device. And, you know, you can ask these simple questions. Now, this one, for men, you can ask, uh, you can see it's got eight questions. So the idea is, is that if the patient scores three out of the eight, then there's probably a very low probability that they have sleep apnea. But if they score five to eight uh, uh, to the answer yes, then there's a very high likelihood of sleep apnea. And in Australia... Medicare, which in, uh, covers or contributes to the costings of a patient getting a sleep study done, they base the criteria for approval based on this particular questionnaire. So, you know, you might say, stop banging, it's easy to remember, snoring. Now, most people will tell you that they don't snore, their wife just complains about it or their husband complains about it, and that's uh, not unusual comment. Do they feel tired? Most of us would say, look, we don't get out of bed zinging in the morning, and most of us don't. But, you know... If you feel weary when you get up or you say, oh, God, I could go back to bed, I could stay in bed longer, or usually about 3 o'clock in the afternoon is a good one, but people start to feel tired, it's a suggestion that they may have sleep apnea. Has anyone ever observed that they stop breathing? So their partner might say they, they're waiting for them to take the next breath. Or sometimes some patients say they wake up sometimes choking. And waking up choking is actually coming out of an obstruction, an apnea event. They might be treated for high blood pressure. If you get a patient, let's say, who is on two or three blood pressure tablets for managing their blood pressure, as strange and as basic as this might sound, consider sleep apnea as a possibility as well because often patients, there is a strong association with elevated blood pressure and sleep apnea. Um, BMI is one of those things that we look at in the sense of how tall is the patient, how heavy are they? Now, sometimes you can look at someone and say, yeah, I bet they're a bit overweight. But remember, too, folks, thin people can have skinny airways. They can have issues as well where they stop breathing and possibly snore. Over 50, not unique. I mean, you can have people in their teenage years that snore and certainly you can have people in their teenage years that have sleep apnea. But over 50, the demonstrated evidence is you're more likely to have that condition than, say, a 20-year-old. Next circumference, you don't have to get a tape measure out and measure their diameter. What you do is you can say to the male, for example, what's your collar size? But if it's 41 centimetres or greater, that would indicate a risk factor for neck circumference, which is, again, indication. Men, we store weight particularly above our waistline more in the neck, interestingly enough. Women, they do too, but also in the hips, as a lot of women will tell you. And the point is it means you've got a narrower airway. And, of course, you get one mark out of eight automatically because you're a male. So you can use this simple scoring system. Very easy. It takes three minutes. And so if you've got a patient who's got a Friedman tongue position type four, you've got a patient who might say, yeah, I snore, and then they do the stop bang questionnaire and they've got a score of four to five, you're looking at someone who could validate uh, to their GP and get a sleep study done. Epworth sleepiness scale or score is something that you can put on your medical history forms. Patients sit in the waiting room, they're reading a magazine or they're waiting for you to get them in. Simply answering the questions, this, you know, if you're reading or sitting down, do you fall asleep? What's the likely, likelihood of this? None or very high. Watching television at night, always struggling to keep awake. Um, sitting inactive in a public place, so like on a bench seat. Um, being a passenger in a car, struggling to keep awake lying down to rest in the afternoon, like siesta, if you're lucky enough to get one of those. And it's sometimes an extreme example, sitting and chatting to someone, drifting off to sleep, after lunch, struggling to keep awake, or a driver in a car where you fall asleep at the traffic lights. And, you know, that one is actually obviously a very serious one, and it does happen. And again, just using a simple scoring mechanism. And so the patient can actually fill this in, because again, remember, they may not be aware that you actually know anything about sleep apnea they might say what does a dentist know about that at the end of the day uh, we know a lot because we actually specialize in the upper airway and so again you can use a very simple scoring mechanism to make a judgment call about um, you know do you 
or don't you have an issue with tiredness? Is it or isn't it related to sleep apnea? And lastly, for women, um, they have, this one is found to be one of the most sensitive measures. It's called the OSA 50. And so, again, you know, I'm not suggesting you get a, uh, a tape measure and measure the circumference of the waist of a lady, but you can get an idea just from their trouser size and do they snore and has anyone ever witnessed them uh, stop breathing? And, again, are they over 50? Again, a scoring mechanism can actually give them an idea. So if you have more than, say, five out of eight, you're looking like a patient who's going to have likelihood of sleep apnea, get a sleep study done. So what is a sleep study? Well, it's rather a bit intrusive, but for some of you watching, you may have already had one, but it's just a technique which brings what we call objectivity. So it means we can measure flow rate through the nose, uh, what your heart rate's like, what your um, oxygen levels are like, what the brain activity is like, to see what the different levels of sleep. You might know or you may not know that when you go to bed at night, you actually go through two stages of light sleep, two stages of deep sleep, and then you go through this thing called REM. And REM's when you're dreaming. And a lot of patients who have sleep apnea never quite get enough REM or don't quite get there. So that's why they feel tired or weary. And as dentists, you know, we know that there are a lot of devices that, um, you know, one can use. And one of the things I think is important is always use a two-piece device. Always allow a basic thing where the mandible can be moving laterally. Because if you have a device that fixes the lower mandible in a position, the likelihood of the patient getting TM temporomandibular disorder, jaw, joint or muscle pain, is much higher. And secondly, another basic principle is what device you like to use, it needs to be adjustable. So you're never going to set your patient at 100% forward. You're going to set them usually about 50% for most people. If they have a diagnosis, what you deem as temporomandibular disorder, so pain in the joint or the muscles, you might make a judgment call to start them at 10 or 20% forward, and then they gradually self-adjust. And for my patients, I teach the patient how to adjust, and I give them some time framing to do it. Uh, some colleagues prefer to do the advancements for their patients themselves. It's whatever you're comfortable to do. The MDSA really stands for Medical Device for Sleep Apnea, and um, it is a very robust device. It's something that, you know, prevents the jaw from dropping open because a lot of people that have these two-piece devices which, which do not restrict mouth opening means that sometimes the success not just for apnea, but for snoring is slightly less. And so one of these type of devices can be very useful to help reduce jaw dropping, keeping the airway open, um, but also forward. Um, some uh, colleagues will be familiar with the Herps device. They, obviously, these are used for orthodontics. Again, the advantage is they're designed so that you can actually adjust them forward based on a uh, simple key and screw mechanism at the back. These are very tough. And what happens is it allows for some movement laterally, um, but it's also very useful, I find, for particularly patients that are quite profound bruxes, where they tend to destroy the device. devices. They tend to be much more um, robust. But again, it's what you're comfortable using. Um, obviously, dorsal fins, for some colleagues, very familiar with these. Again, a it, it titratable two-piece device. So... I suppose, in short, that's the real essence of what an oral appliance therapy is. You're aiming to actually influence the diameter of the upper airway. When you make one of these devices for your patients, I'd strongly recommend that you consider um, definitely having a sleep study done. So use the questionnaire criteria as one of your guidelines. Have a look at the anatomy, which you regularly do anyway, to see if the patient may have a prediction about possibility of sleep apnea. And I think even more importantly, um, make it known that you're interested in this area because a lot of patients who come and see you for restorative, periodontal health, um, all kinds of things, they often don't realise that we have, uh, we're skilled in the upper airway. We can offer much more than just simply um, making sure that their oral health is good, we can actually contribute to their general health. Thank you. Uh, look, Professor Stubbs, um, I've got questions pouring through the door. Um, we have finished a little early, so if you, might, if you don't mind, I might just get started on them. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to bring up here, first one from Ramanjit Kaur. 
Uh, what are your thoughts on using laser for snoring and sleep apnea treatment? Uh, I'm aware of the treatment. Um, I, if you're talking about using laser to stiffen the soft palate, it's probably going to be more effective for snoring. Um, it's not a permanent solution. If you're referring to like ear, nose and throat surgeons do, where they do a what we call a U triple P, which is where they so or actually just shorten the soft palate. The laser is much kinder, but again, um, uh, you know, the issue you have is it might be relatively um, unintrusive to have done, but what happens is basically as a patient gets older, patient puts on weight, patient, uh, you know, lifestyle factors, et cetera, I would be interested to see what the long-term outcome and success of those are. Okay, appreciate that. Um, we have a question. I find the nylon splints way too flexible to work effectively as a snoring device. Is there a more rigid printed splint material that can be used? Yeah, um, there is. Um, the nylon ones, I agree, they are very flexible. Um, and the other thing too is I find that I've tried some for my patients, but they're very uh, hard on the natural teeth. They're very uh, tight, whereas sometimes the, the, let's say the clear splint material or bilaminum material, it actually is a lot softer, but you do need some sense of rigidity to actually make sure that the mandible can't ping off the sides because when whatever device you're using, you need to be able to keep the mandible forward. And any time you titrate, which is one of the reasons why the MDSA has its advantages because as you're bringing them forward, uh, you're not relying on the fact that the change in the upper and the lower rims that dimensional change that happens as the mandible comes forward is not dependent on the fin and the block relationship like the dorsal fin is. And so um, I think the nylon ones, again, if you're happy to use them, that's great. They're a good device, but I don't use them for that reason. Um, all right. Can you give us some more points to help convince the patient that sleep deprivation is damaging to their health, as I believe it can cause brain damage? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll give an example. You can just say to your patient, did you know if you smoke, you're twice as likely to have a stroke than if you don't smoke? But if you've got sleep apnea, you're four times more likely to have a stroke. You're four times more likely to have a heart attack. You're um, more likely, the association with diabetes type 2, now diabetes type 2, as you know, is often uh, um, glucose intolerance, but it's also insulin intolerance, but it's actually obviously to do with a lot with dietary intake and body weight. And the interesting thing is if you have a patient who is overweight, type 2 diabetic, it's almost a given that they're going to have obstructive sleep apnea. Um, the fact that patients often feel like um, that they have reflux, I mean, some people get silent reflux because of sleep apnea, because when you have the apnea events and you stop breathing, the pressure in your lung space increases to try to breathe. It pushes on the stomach and it drives up the, the contents. So it is actually something that um, is a significant case, a significant health issue. I think the other thing to tell you too, in 2013, there was a great uh, article published in the Journal of Respiratory Medicine, American Journal of Respiratory Medicine by Adnam and others, and what they did was they looked at severe apnea. Now, when we talk about severe, mild, and moderate, what does that really mean? Well, you might be interested to know that if you stop breathing less than five times an hour, that's actually normal. You'd think it should be zero, wouldn't you? But it, normal is less than five. But six to 15 events is mild. 15 or 16 to 30 is moderate severity. And over 30 is severe. And there are the American protocols are that if you certainly severe, or greater than 25 events, they usually go for the pump as your first line therapy. And this particular study in 2013 looked at a very large number of patients. In fact, they had 177 severe apnea, so they're all over 30 events an hour that um, use CPAP. They had 72 patients that just had the dental device because they couldn't tolerate the CPAP. And they had 212 severe apnea patients, no treatment, because they didn't want treatment or they may have had no teeth, so they couldn't have a dental device. And they had, I think it was about 240 uh, patients without apnea, and they followed them up over seven years. And what they found was the likelihood of dying related to a heart attack or a stroke, the group with severe apnea, no treatment, were the highest. The group with uh, no apnea at all were the lowest. 
but the CPAP users and the dental device users, there was actually no difference in um, the, statistically anyway of any difference in likelihood of dying from a stroke or heart disease. So what it really means is, is that even though when you make a dental device, sure, it's not as, in some cases, not as effective as a CPAP, but it's still a very effective treatment. And so they're the kind of conversations that you would have with your patient. But you can tell from your medical history too. I mean, if you see a patient that's ticked uh, hypertension, um, cardiac arrhythmia, I mean, if they've got, for example, atrial fibrillation, did you know that 60% of patients who have atrial fibrillation, that's where the atria, given a regular heartbeat, is correlated with sleep apnea? Congestive cardiac failure, 50%. So a patient ticks these little boxes in your medical history and you can say to yourself, that's interesting. Did you know um, the, the, you're a diabetic? Yes, they'll say, of course, I tick the box. Did you know that, you know, um, do you ever get any complaints on snoring? You can start the conversation. Yeah, right. Um, look, some that, some really good points there, uh, Professor Stubbs, and things that, um, you know, uh, Brett Taylor was talking about last week, managing your patient expectations, what to say and how to introduce um treatment plans and care uh, and, and some really powerful tools there. Um, I have a question here. Are there any changes to the protrusive manufacturing amounts for class three patients? No. They're both the same, all right? All the same, yeah. And if you register, if your patient registers high on a stop bang, should you recommend a sleep study before a mandibular advancement device? Definitely. Okay. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, there's a couple of really important things here. I think, firstly, um, from an ethical perspective, but also a legal perspective, if you take on the management of a patient, let's say they just said, no, I don't care about the apnea, I'm just sick of it, I need the snoring sort, otherwise I'm going to get a divorce, right? And some people say that. Then the thing is, um, that's one thing. But the problem you have is you may be under-treating them. And if they end up having, let's say, a transport accident because they fell asleep on the wheel, and it comes back to the fact they had under-treatment of sleep apnea, you're in the firing line. So it's always good to make sure you get the data right, get the objective evidence. We're evidence-based people. So if you can, get a sleep study done. It does give a sense of framework that what you're treating. The sleep physicians, certainly in Australia and New Zealand, and I imagine in the US and the UK would be the same, they dictate the recommended treatments. My point to you is if you have a patient that the sleep physician has said, you need CPAP, the pump, and the patient says, I'm not having that, I don't want that, I can't wear it, very reasonable to make them a dental advice. You don't need to do another sleep study. They've already been diagnosed. And can a general dentist get them made for their patients or do you need a special training for this? Look, I would advocate special training, but that special training, um, you know, is, is uh, something that uh, is available online. But also, you know, um, there are courses that you can do i mean we as dentists we're experts in the upper airway all we need to do is impart the knowledge to you of how to treat your patients and go through with you things like what do you do if the patient has a bite change clusal change what do you do and how do you manage the patient with tmd symptoms uh how do you manage the patient if the patient keeps breaking their device or they actually say to you um, i can't tolerate the device anymore it's too bulky so they're things that you learn through the process of guidance. And uh, there is no reason why any dentist can't treat a patient with this condition. It's just knowing how to do it and also, I think, when to do it. Yeah, okay. Look, um, we do have a number of more questions. Oh, we're running a little low on time. I'll finish with this one, uh, Michael. Is bruxism related to sleep apnea? In other words, does sleep apnea lead to bruxism? Yeah, and some people. Now, bruxism, of course, doesn't occur just in sleep apnea patients. I mean, we know bruxism can occur, for example, some medications, particularly the antidepressants, uh, SSRIs they're known as, or SNRIs. But we also understand that people, as part of their normal sleep cycle, can also have episodes of bruxism. Most of it occurs in the light stage of sleep. But what is interesting, if you have a look at the anatomy we went through, you have a look at the questionnaires and the particular their medical history. And even if they you did a simple stop bang and the patient's talking about, oh, look, my teeth are sore when I wake up in the morning, it's a good conversation to have because in patients, the treatment of the bruxism may also be helping to treat the sleep apnea. If you have a patient, let's say, who's got sleep apnea 
doesn't know it, it's got TMD, and you think, look, I'll make them an occlusal splint like those nice ones the race dental make, then the thing is if you do that, you're actually giving or compromising space in the mouth because of the splint with the tongue and you're actually making their apnea worse. So you don't, I don't believe in this dogma where every person you suspect has bruxism, you've got to get a sleep study, but you can use some of those simple little tools we just shared with you to actually screen people in and out whether they should have a study or not. And more importantly, if you do get someone who's got quite profound bruxism and you want to go all the way, it's very reasonable to talk about sleep apnea as a possibility. But remember, not every patient who bruxes has sleep apnea. Yeah, look, I really appreciate your comprehensive approach, Michael. Um, I'm gonna have to leave it there. We do have a number of other questions. That question came in from Prakti Bali. Andreas Tomeo says, hello. We've got people who are obviously very popular amongst the, the midst here, mate. But look, if anyone is, uh, is needs more information, feel free to contact me, Matt, at racedental.com.au. Alternatively, call our customer support team at Race. Um, if you do wanna make contact with Professor Stubbs, go to Dr. Michael Stubbs at hotmail.com. But thank you once again, Professor Stubbs. We appreciate your time. Your knowledge is unsurpassed and we really appreciate you joining us today for the Race Academy webinar series. We hope everyone's learned what they need to, to deliver better care for their patients. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar series. Thank you, Ian, Michael. Thank you. We thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Be safe. Thank you.